All right, let's try that again. Let me disconnect and try that again. All right, go ahead and call him back. So, Diana, when, when he was talking, is it about the same level as when I'm talking? Okay. Right. Howdy. How's that? Video on now? No, sir. Interesting. Tiana, you're clicking the video call button, right? Yeah. Okay. Sister, turn off video. Is there um, a light on on your webcam? Actually, it's on the it's on my laptop, so it does not have a, a webcam, and it's showing my. Uh, how's that? There you go. All right. That was it. All right. You all ready? I hope so. All right, Jasmine, you started that one there. Yeah. And Danny, you started all yours. You started yours. Good. All right. Here we go in three, two, one. What's up, y'all? Welcome to the Sports Medicine Broadcast number 203, What is Next in Athletic Training Education. This week, our guest is Dr. Mark Merrick. He's going to be talking. He's actually got a presentation he's going to be doing um, in a week week or so, I think, next week. Is that what you said, Dr. Mark? Actually, later this week. Later this week. So he's just kind of warming up here with us, going to give us a little, little bit of that presentation, talking about what is next in athletic training education. I'm your host, Jeremy Jackson. Right beside me, I've got... Ariana. Diana. Jasmine. Tiana. All right. Do you want to join our conversation at sportsmedicinebroadcast.com? And this one will be C-A-A-T-E because Dr. Merrick is the president of the Commission on Accreditation of Athletic Training Education, or CATE, as they like to say. So it's C-A-A-T-E. So Dr. Merrick is a president of the Commission on Accreditation of Athletic Training Education. Um, Dr. Merrick, you previously spoke with us on the podcast at uh, U of H, well, Kind of, you spoke to the crowd and I, and I recorded it. And so that's episode number 161. If you want to check out his previous presentation and see how it lines up with what he's got today. Quickly, um, my official hydration equipment of the sports medicine broadcast is Frio Hydration. If you want to email them if you want to get a quote, make sure you mention the sports medicine broadcast and they give you a little special discount. Without much further ado, Tiana's got our first question for Dr. Merrick. Dr. Merrick. Give us a brief rundown of the entry-level master's movement. Okay, well, that's a really short question to a really big issue. Um, as you're probably all aware, last May, the, uh, the boards of the members of the Strategic Alliance all voted to make a move for athletic training education at the professional level to the master's entry. <clears throat> if you're not keeping track of all the different levels of, of education in AT, the KD actually accredits professional programs, which lead to eligibility for the BOC exam. We accredit post-professional programs, and post-professional programs are for people who are already BOC credential holders and already athletic trainers, and we also accredit residencies. The professional programs will all be moving to the master's degree, and the, uh, excuse me, the deadline on that will be fall of 2022, and we've previously announced that, so that's not new information. But the way that that works is programs will no longer be able to enroll undergraduate students in their athletic training education programs as of fall of 2022. Um, as we are moving forward towards that date, you know, we're less than a year out now since the decision uh, was made. So we've got a lot of work ahead of us in terms of what that's going to look like. And that's some things that we've been working on here at the Katy. Um, I think the ECE from NATA has also been working on a, a lot of support materials relative to that for programs. But some things that you can expect to see are some changes in the KD accreditation standards that will reflect uh, really what's truly graduate education. So the process for doing that is not complete. So we don't have all those answers yet, but we're getting a lot closer. The standards committee met uh, literally just last week in Chicago working on a draft of some of the things that they're doing. And we have a, a commission call later this week where we'll be talking with the standards committee about their vision on, on some of those things and what some of those current standards uh, that they're going to be proposing are going to look like. Whenever the KD adopts new standards, those standards will go through a, an approval process 
that involves things like open comment uh, with the public. So any of the things that we talk about here today that are conceptual <clears throat> will at some point in the, the future, in some cases the relatively near future, will go out for comment for people to, to give us some feedback and, and let us know their thoughts on those. And then we'll take that comment and use it to help us refine what actually will go into the final version of the standards. Sometimes it actually takes us multiple rounds of open comment before we get to the final version. That's not unusual for us at all. So that's sort of the, the process from here. In terms of things you might expect, uh, we at the Katie have been talking for some time about some of the things that we believe, uh, and you'll see those, I think, reflected in the standards. I don't want to get too far ahead of those standards proposals because I honestly haven't seen them yet because they're still in process. But we've said for a while that the KD values creativity and excellence in education. We value things like programmatic autonomy. We think athletic trainers need to have a strong scientific foundational knowledge, a knowledge that's going to put us on equal footing with other members of the healthcare team. We are in favor of programs that produce athletic trainers who want athletic training as a career. We want them to be prepared to be a good member of the interprofessional healthcare team. And those are some things that are coming. Um, along that line, there are some things that are standard in healthcare education, which haven't been standard in athletic education or athletic training education as uh, in the existing standards. And some of those include things like the Institute of Medicine core competencies for healthcare professionals. So those are the, some of the kinds of things we've been saying for several years that we believe should be a part of athletic training education and our standards committee has been working on that. In fact, at our accreditation conference back in October in Tampa, uh, Sarah Brown, the chair of the standards committee gave a, a really good talk talking a little bit about some of the things that the standards committee has been working on. And some of those things included outcomes. Right now, everybody's probably familiar with standard 11, although you might not know it by that name, it's the 70% pass rate standard. And, you know, in addition to pass rates, there are a lot of other standards or a lot of other outcomes that programs really need to be looking at to be able to show that they're offering a quality program. So some things we talked about would include uh, reporting of things like graduation rates and retention rates, and placement rates. So some outcomes reporting is going to be important for programs to do in the future. We've talked a little bit about preparatory knowledge and trying to have athletic trainers have that similar background footing as our healthcare peers. We've talked a little bit about professional knowledge, and I'm sure I'll get to that a little bit more here later in the in this podcast. But our professional knowledge has to adapt to reflect the standard of care that athletic trainers are already providing. And in a lot of cases, athletic trainers do things that our current standards don't yet require from a, a national basis, but that are happening in isolated pockets here and there. I think we'll probably see some changes in clinical education. You know, we've talked for a while about athletic trainers would benefit from having a period of immersive clinical experience where you're doing clinicals on a full-time basis as a student rather than just seeing athletic training from one o'clock to five o'clock in the afternoon and thinking that's what the career looks like. We've talked a little bit about institutional alignment in the past. And you know that's one that's a little bit near and dear to me. When you look across the spectrum of athletic training education programs, it has been uh, 20 years really since the board of directors said that athletic training education programs need to be housed with other healthcare programs at your institution. But here we are 20 years later, and that's still a very small minority of programs that are there. And one of the things that I found in my role, in addition to being the president of Acadia, I'm the program director at Ohio State, um, here I am fortunate enough to be housed in a college of medicine and in a school of health and rehab sciences with other, other professions like PT and OT, respiratory therapy, radiologic science, HIMSS, medical dietetics, um, a lot of different other healthcare professions. There's a lot of cultural things that happen in healthcare education that a lot of our students and a lot of our programs don't get to experience if they don't have connections with other healthcare units. <clears throat> so I would envision 
you know, the, the future standards taking institutional alignment head on and, and looking at ways that we can try to change that. So those are some of the kinds of things that we've been talking about for a while. Um, a lot of work is underway there, but none of that stuff is yet set in stone and it won't be until we have a proposal for those from the standards committee and we vet that go through some focus groups and then sending that out for an open comment period that I would anticipate would happen probably late spring or early summer this year. Gotcha. All right, so we're going to quickly welcome Dr. Josh Yellen to the broadcast. He was given a test, so he had to join us late. Dr. Yellen, say hello. Hello, everybody. How are you? Hi, Dr. Merrick. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Josh. How are you? I'm doing fine. I think this is an outstanding conversation, and um, thanks for agreeing to be a part of the SMB. Always happy to have a dialogue, and I, I think that sometimes that doesn't happen often enough. I think a lot of folks have this impression that the KD comes up with stuff and imposes it and doesn't engage in, in these kinds of conversations. So these are really important to us. So if I can ask you a question along those lines, you know, I jumped in about, um, you know, obviously athletic training being part of the health education, healthcare education topography, if you will. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we see in other healthcare professions is, um, you know, almost this indoctrination into you know the medical village if you will um, and so a lot of a lot of professions use a white coat ceremony to do that what are your thoughts on athletic training um, pursuing something like that that you know should it be a white coat should it be other some other symbolic gesture to you know introduce you into the medical community I love the idea I don't know that we'd require that as a standard, but, but as, a, as a cultural norm, I think it's a great idea. I think that it's not something we've ever really done. I think some programs do some isolated things here and there, but I, I love the idea because you really are entering into a career and you have that like, a clear entry point where you need to change your way of thinking about yourself as a professional. So some kind of, a, a, of an enculturation ceremony, I think is a great idea. Okay. Hi, right, Dr. Merrick. I'm, I was pretty interested. You said you're in the department with all the, the radiology and uh, you listed like five or six different things there. Um, tomorrow, we're actually going to be talking with uh, Dr. Forrest Pekka from Idaho. Uh, yes. And, and he's going to be talking about clinical residencies and, and that kind of thing. So we'll save a little bit of that conversation for him. But um, how common is it for athletic training to be in, in the same building as those other medical professions? I haven't seen an update on that in a couple of years, and I would have to go digging through our uh, our analytic report, which is in process right now on, on being made from last year's annual report data. But the last time I, I looked at that data, around one program in five, so around 20% of programs were actually housed in a healthcare-related academic unit. Now, beyond that, there are some programs that may have isolated connections here and there, but it's it's not a mainstream thing yet. And that uh, that sometimes, I think, puts us at a disadvantage because there are a lot of cultural norms in healthcare that we don't realize or understand. And I, I think that the opportunity to be a part of that village that Dr. Yellen mentioned is really a, a big piece of the vision for the future. In fact, that's one of the things that we as a strategic alliance between the KD and the NATA and Board of Certification and the NATA Foundation have talked about that Athletic trainers are healthcare providers, and we need to have preparation and a culture that, that really prepares us for a mainstream role in healthcare. So those are part of the, the elements that become important in that mainstream kind of role and vision for ourselves. I I went through an internship program, and I'm you know you see stuff on Facebook. People are mad about the entry level masters, and that's not the conversation. It's done. We're we're moving forward. And so I'm actually having been you know talking with Josh and, and uh, Mark over there at U of H, I'm really impressed with what is going into athletic training education now because they have such an impressive background of knowledge before they leave the field. You know, some of the people gripe about, well, they don't ever put in the, the same hours that we do. They don't, they don't get to interact with the athletes the same way we do or we did. You know, they don't spend all those hours in the athletic training room um, that we did. Yes, but I personally know that my background education was not anywhere close to what these kids are coming out with. They're going to learn the hands-on practical part. 
So let's give them a chance to learn that. And I know at U of H, they're doing a great job of saying, hey, go out to the marathon. Hey, go out to this tournament. Hey, go do this, go do that. So you can get some of that practical volunteer experience. So I'm, I'm really impressed and I look forward to seeing what it is because, you know, like I said, this is my 12th year in the profession and I came out of an internship with a non-accredited program. So it, it really is interesting to see where we are going forward. So, you know, I've, uh, I'm about twice as long out as you. This is my 25th year <laughs> as, a, as a certified athletic trainer. And I am insanely jealous of what our students get today that we didn't have when I was a student. You know, my first day on my first job back in the early 90s, I was in an outpatient clinic where I was seeing patients in the clinic in the morning and out of, out of the high school in the afternoon. And the first patient came in and I partnered up with somebody and doing the evaluation and they asked me to write a silk note. And in 1992, I had never heard of a soap mm -hmm. um, because it wasn't part of my athletic training education because we didn't do that in the athletics model. Um, so I felt naked and exposed as a provider because something everybody else went, well, what do you mean you've never heard of soap milk? Um, I had no clue. There's a lot of things. I, I, I use that as an example, not because we don't know soap milk, because we've come so very far in a lot of the things that we do, but there's still a long way for us to go. Interprofessional education, for example, is one of the five Institute of Medicine core competencies that every healthcare provider should have. This isn't a new idea. The IOM came out with those core competencies 13 years ago, yet very few athletic training programs do any kind of formalized IPE. It's expanding, and NATA has a, a really good IPE interest group that, that Tony Breitbach leads and, and does a really good job with that man, we got a long way to go where we are learning about each other, with each other, and from each other. And if we're going to practice as an interprofessional healthcare team, then we have to train as an interprofessional healthcare team. And we have to understand and embrace each other's roles and figure out how we each add to that Venn diagram of care that that patient needs. There's some things that we can do and do really, really well but there's some things that we don't do and other members of the team do. And until we, we get to know each other, that's something that I think we're going to continue to struggle with. We're still a little too isolated. Yeah, Mark, can I ask you a question from Katie's standpoint? Um, you know, it is one of those things that silos are very dangerous. And if in athletic training, if we want to be part of medicine, we want to act medicine, behave medicine, speak medicine, and start to engage in a lot of that IPE and, and the um, interprofessional competencies, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Why, in your opinion, has it taken athletic training longer to you know, accept this? Because if we look at other medical professions, and I, I include PT, OT, uh, even kinesiotherapy, chiropractic, in kind of that same you know, model as athletic training, with the exception of the fact that athletic training is probably, from a historical perspective, the new kid on the block, really kind of entering in the 70s, etc. What else have you seen as being roadblocks to us entering into this, you know, like we'll just call it the medical village? I think there are fewer external roadblocks than we think, and I think there are more internal roadblocks than we think. You know, externally, as a profession, we always consider ourselves in from the viewpoint of other peer healthcare professions we sometimes see as, as competitors in the marketplace. Well, this profession might be a barrier to us in our practice act, or they're never going to let us do this, or we're looking for some kind of external affirmation or external endorsement of who we are and what we do. And the reality is there's really nobody out there to do that. We had a talk at our accreditation conference that was done by uh, John Schultz, who's one of the physician members of the, uh, of the commission. And in Dr. Schultz's talk, he really talked about what is this level two provider thing? And he talked about the, the taxonomy and the way that that works. And it really is just a taxonomy. It's not, there's not a status associated with it. And there's not a set of permissions or, or things that you're allowed, excuse me, allowed to do when you have these, it's simply a taxonomy of the way things are organized. The reality is, if we want to be able to do some things within our practice, first thing we have to do is say that this is important for our practice. 
then we have to show that we have appropriate education and training to do those things. Then we need to do them and tell people that this is what athletic trainers do. For example, all three of us are old enough to remember when athletic trainers never used the D word. You know, we don't diagnose, we evaluate, mm -hmm. we, we have an impression. Um, yes, we actually do diagnose. And it took us forever to embrace the word diagnosis because we were afraid we might step on somebody else's toes. Well, yeah, of course we diagnose. There's a lot of things that we do in our practice that we might consider doing in our practice that we often self-limit. For example, uh, does an athletic trainer reduce a dislocation? I can show you a whole lot of people, so athletic trainers don't reduce dislocations. Well, is there somebody in a better position to reduce that dislocation than we are when we're there when the acute injury happens? before that person has had a, a chance to really set in with a lot of spasm. Now, you need to be trained to do it. You need to be in communication with your physician. But why are those not things that we do? Why do athletic trainers need the physician to come over to your athletic training room to give your team an allergy shot? Why can we not administer the medication by the appropriate route for the drug that's there? Well, we have a hang up about using the, the metal pointy things on the end of the syringe because there was a time in athletic training where the idea of giving somebody an injection to allow them to play was considered to be, oh, that's unethical. Well, you know, using a medication to let somebody play against medical advice is, is unethical. It has nothing to do with the fact that it's an injection. It's, it's using the medication. Athletic trainers are healthcare providers. There's no reason that our education and our training and our practice shouldn't let us fulfill some of those kinds of roles. And we do. There are athletic trainers who do all of those things and do them on a regular basis, but they're not always things that have been mainstream requirements and are standardized. And I, I think the future will see some of those changing. In fact, there's a, a working group working on that right now. And, and again, I don't want to get too far in front of them because they're working on what the draft of those future things might hold. Uh, but the way that that working group has been put together, is this is not just a, a Katie thing. This is an athletic training thing. It's about the practice of athletic training. So at the request of the Katie, we asked the other members of the Strategic Alliance, so NATA and BOC and, and Foundation, and, and talked with them about the athletic trainer as a healthcare provider. And we asked for representatives from you know, NATA and BOC to come together with representatives from the Katie to make a steering committee on what the future professional knowledge for athletic training will hold, the next, the next edition of it. And that committee came together and formed a process. And that process includes a, a couple of different elements, probably the most important of which is they then reached out to a lot of experts in a lot of different areas, including a lot of the NATA committees, like the College and University Committee and the Committee on Practice Advancement and, and other committees to say, who are experts and who are athletic trainers doing interesting kinds of things as part of their practice? And that they brought that a small working group together of experts to say, what are the things that we should be including in athletic training education in the future to prepare providers to work in your job setting? And again, this is for the future. It's not reflected in the current, the, the current educational competencies, but things that we might have in the future. And they, they have been working pretty hard on that list. Um, I think we can all probably guess some of the low-hanging fruit that are on there, but we need to let that process work its way out. And, and the draft document that they produce will work its way through that steering group, and it'll be focus grouped with, with some different people, some different committees, and, and different, uh, different kind of groups, and that'll help them refine it. And then that refined version will send out for open comment to the public to say, you know, here's what we are proposing for the future content of athletic training education. And it'll go through at least one round of open comment. I won't be surprised if it takes more than one. That does sometimes happen. And when it's all said and done, we'll, we'll have a new set of content. And one of the things that'll be a little different about that content is where it's housed and how it looks. We've always had a separate set of educational competencies, or knowledge, skills, and abilities um, that have been in a separate document from the accreditation standards. And, and other professions don't really do it that way. Their educational content is part of their educational standards. And we'll see that in the future version that comes out for us. So 
rather than having a standalone document, that'll become part of the standards. So instead of the 109 standards we have now, we'll have additional sets of, of standards over what things we have to teach and students need to be able to do. And, and I said that last part intentionally. It's largely going to be about what students need to be able to do. So when you look at our current version of competencies or the version that preceded it, we have hundreds and hundreds of educational competencies. In fact, I, we've got over 400 now. At the high water mark, it was, it was getting close to 700 at one point. But we have things like we have to be able to evaluate the ankle and the hip and the knee and the shoulder and the elbow and the fingers and, and this laundry list of joints. The way most other healthcare professions do it, and the way I think you'll see it, it come out of our committee and into the, the comment, is it'll be worded a lot more broadly. So we'll say things like athletic trainers do musculoskeletal evaluation and diagnosis. And we kind of assume that if it says musculoskeletal, that wouldn't probably involve all the joints. We don't need to make a list of all the joints in the body. So a little less taxonomy approach and a little more broadly worded. It will probably say something along the lines of athletic trainers provide acute care and ongoing care and managed care rather than defining every single procedure that an athletic trainer does. So I'll pick on wound care for a moment. Um, if we talk about wound care, when we say something like athletic trainers provide comprehensive management of wounds, well, comprehensive management of wounds would include things like evaluating and diagnosing those wounds, cleaning and preparing those wounds, and probably primary closure of those wounds through things like suturing. Um, rather than listing out each individual procedure. Now, I suspect that some of the procedures that uh, are not things we've done a lot in the past, we may have to delineate some of those out specifically. So we'd probably use a word like including and list some of the things that uh, might be new content. So um, those are some of the, the things I think you might see work their way in. But I think it'll look different than it does now. Mark, I'd like to ask you a question, you know, for people that are outside of athletic training education, um, they don't understand the benefit of the Katie being recognized by the CHIA. And, and so can you elaborate on that for all those that are listening? Can you, can you elaborate on why that was such a big step for the Katie to achieve that? CHIA recognition is functionally accreditation of an accreditor. Maybe a good conceptual way to think about okay, it. Okay, before we get there, what is yep. CHIA? Ah, CHIA, Committee on, on uh, Higher Education Accreditation. Okay. So CHIA is the overriding body who oversees a number of different accreditors and a number of different professions. So CHIA has standards that an accreditor has to meet in order to be a recognized accreditor. It's a way of, of external review for accountability and, and, uh, and quality of the work that we do as an accreditor. And so can you give a little list of, you know, if I'm not mistaken, I think PT's in there, OT's in there, podiatry's in there, psychology's in there. Uh, there there's a lot, and it certainly includes all those and more. Um, okay. PA is in there. It also includes accreditors who aren't healthcare, so it's not a healthcare unit. It's a higher ed accreditation organization, but it is the higher ed rec accrediting recognition organization, the group who says this accreditor meets norms and standards as an accreditor and offers quality accreditation services. So it is our external review and external accountability mechanism is, uh, is our recognition by CHIA. Unlike some professions, uh, athletic training is not currently regulated through the Department of Education directly. We do not, as an accreditor, grant an institution eligibility for students to receive financial aid. So financial aid comes through your university, but it's not because you have an athletic training program. There are some other standalone professions that have perhaps their own school who do that, who you gain financial aid eligibility by being a student in that school, and they're directly regulated by the government. We're sort of indirectly. There are certainly some government rules and things we have to follow, but most of the things that we do are outlined through CHIA. Okay. Um, Going back to some of the benefits of, obviously, and, and there are a number of people that are listening to this podcast, so um, I want to be able to ask you some questions that may address some of the questions that we've received over the last little bit. 
And so as athletic training is moving into this entry level master's model, we have until 2022 to do it, correct? Correct. Okay. And so can you, you know, for all those that are listening, can you talk about the benefits going back to that white paper document that was released in 2013 of, of why it's so important that we move to this entry level masters, because you still have some people out there that are, you know, I'll call it from the old school that just don't see the benefit of why we're doing it. And, um, would say things like, well, you know, this is going to be, you know, more debt that a student takes on pay is not going to increase job opportunities are not going to increase. And that white paper document, I thought did a really good job of outlining the 11 reasons as to why. So from, from your perspective, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, certainly the white paper is applying and, and it was meant as a starting point for the conversation, not a definitive be all end all set of rationale. And I, I think the, the conversation evolved on beyond that, but there are some really good pieces that are in there that I think are pretty important. Among some of the others is that you're seeing a general trend moving this direction across a lot of, of areas in healthcare. And to position ourselves where we need to be for the future, this was a piece of that step. But educationally, there's a lot of important pieces too. Right now, I run an undergraduate athletic training education program. It's a little different than the one Josh runs at U of H. But when my students come in, like most of the students in the U.S., uh, you know, we were probably 340-ish of the 375 programs that are out there are undergraduate. And those students are balancing an undergraduate education, balancing having to take their geology class and their Western Civ class and their performing arts class and all the other general education or liberal studies requirements that they have, plus their athletic training education, plus their educational content all at the same time. Which means in a typical semester, my students might have a history of rock and roll class, a class uh, in, in fine arts, uh, another class that's a, a, some, a general healthcare thing that everybody in our school takes, plus their AT curriculum. So they're really spread in a lot of different directions. One of the real advantages that I'm looking forward to is when students are in a dedicated graduate program, all they're doing really is athletic training education. You define that curriculum for the most part, and they're really in a much more immersive environment. And having the opportunity to, to talk with some of my colleagues in my own school who have seen their degree programs change from undergraduate to graduate entry, their comments are they wish they'd have done it 10 years earlier because the ability to have that student who's focused entirely on what they're doing in professional training, I think makes a huge difference. They also comment to me all the time about the benefit it is to have the maturity of the graduate student versus the undergraduate student. The you know, undergraduate students are sorting themselves out. And, and to be quite frank, our undergraduate students of today are different than our undergraduate students 10 or 20 years ago. They are less independent. I think that when they come in, they're doing a lot more searching, and I, I think they're a lot less ready to have responsibility of healthcare early on in their programs. I think there's some benefits there. As you look across the healthcare spectrum, uh, some of the things that we need to include in athletic training education that we don't include right now aren't going to fit in our existing programs. And you're not going to be able to just take an existing AT program that has a finite number of, of of, uh, of AT credit hours and shoehorn in some new kinds of, of training because you have that constant balance of if I add an extra credit hour here, well, I've really got to pull that extra credit hour out of something else and I can't touch those sacred cows of liberal studies and general education and, and those things are fixed and finite. So what we wind up doing is, you know what, I'm going to scrap the physics class and I'm just going to have to teach them what they need to know about physics in an introductory lecture in my modalities class which limits how much depth and richness I can afford in that modalities class. So I got to figure out what am I trimming out to be able to include the foundational piece because I don't have room for a physics class. So the ability to, to use an undergraduate program to help that student grow up, to mature, to get a general education and a broader education and background foundations lets us not have to remediate them when they get into the AT program let's us focus on the richness and focus on the depth of what they're getting and frankly try to put them on a better footing than we all had as, as students when we came out of our programs. Um, 
the master's decision wasn't easy. I think that there's a lot of benefits to it. I think that there's a lot of, of things that are that are hard. I think more time is is one of the things that worries people as well as, as the income side of it. But the reality is we have already created a de facto system where the master's degree is the entry point for most practitioners in our profession. And it's been that way for a long, long time. You know, I graduated with my bachelor's degree in 1991. And of course, in 1991, almost everybody was going to grad school because you weren't going to be able to get the job you wanted without the master's degree. Well, this changes that not nearly so much as we think it does. It means that that master's degree piece is in athletic training, but it's it's a focused degree in AT as opposed to I'm getting a master's degree in anything that fits around my schedule as a grad assistant. I mean, my master's degree is in athletic training, and it's it's focused on not just the, the bits and pieces we've always had, but the ability to enrich in that education and, and better, better put us on a footing to, to work as part of that interprofessional healthcare team. All right, Dr. Merrick, so, I got to I got to jump in here. Um, go ahead. We're going to be talking with Dr. Forrest Pekka about the uh, residencies and the post professional stuff like that. But can you give me a brief overview of what those are, um, what those look like for an athletic trainer? I'm going to start with what they aren't. Okay. Residencies are not the new grad assistantship, and I, I want to be really, really clear about what I think residencies are and what I think the commission sees them are. Residencies are not a transition to practice experience. They're not an experience aimed at taking a, an inexperienced practitioner and getting them comfortable with providing athletic training practice. Uh, we need better transition to practice, and there's a, a working group who's actually working on that that has both NATA and, and KD folks who are working together on ways to do that, but that's not what residency is. Residency, when you look across the spectrum of healthcare, is about making a specialist practitioner, a practitioner with advanced skills and advanced experience in a specialty area of practice. So athletic training is really, really broad. You know, specialties might include some things like orthopedics, and there's already some work on an orthopedic specialty certification that's happening over on with, uh, with NATA and with uh, the newly approved NATA, uh, NATA recently approved the, the creation of the board of creation of a BAT, the board of athletic training specialties, and those specialty groups will figure out what the specialty areas are. But residency trains you to be a specialist, whether that's in orthopedics or pediatrics or perhaps primary care. There's a lot of different areas that we might move into. So. A residency is a focused period of training as a specialist. And there's even things beneath that that would be subspecialties, which would be more in the, in the, the neighborhood of a fellowship. For example, you might do a, a residency in orthopedics and a fellowship in shoulder. Much like an orthopedic surgeon might, but ours are perhaps more on the rehab side. So residencies are about making specialty advanced practitioners. And you can't do that in the classroom entirely. I really personally think, and I, I think that a lot of folks out there sort of think along this line, and that'd be interesting to, to hear what the forest thinks on this, but I think you get to become a specialist by treating patients with these kinds of problems. There's a, a, an important experiential component. And at the end of the day, if we do it right, residencies will match up with the newly being created specialty exams, specialty certs exams coming out of the bats, and you'll see residency as a primary means of becoming a specialist and getting a specialty certification. So they're going to look different than GAs. I don't think that they are well suited to somebody coming immediately out of an undergraduate program in the near term or immediately out of a professional program. I think they're best for people who have practiced for a couple of years to then go back and become a specialist. But I can certainly say that some people want to might go directly into one. But again, not as a transition to practice, as a means of becoming a specialist. And so how do you see those residency programs driving future education needs? So do you see, like, for instance, one of the things that we've talked about before was obviously, there, you know, there's more DAT programs coming up and online, and I think that's meeting a certain need. How, how do you feel like this is going to drive higher education in athletic training? That's a great question. Um, 
Most residency programs, in certainly in athletic training, we don't have a lot of them yet, there's just a few, but even across the spectrum of health care, mm -hmm. most residency programs are not in educational institutions. They're in clinical practices. And that fits with the concept of what a residency is, making a specialist. And it's about getting repetitions with patients as well as having educational components with that. I think that post-professional education in the future will look to fill a different niche. I don't think it will look as much about making a specialist as it will be making a, an advanced practice excuse me, an advanced practitioner who's maybe a, a equipped to do that a little bit differently. If you went to the last educator conference, you heard Russ Richardson give a, a very good talk that was based largely around the, the content that Eric Sowers wrote in the education issue of NATA News a year or so ago about the continuum of education for the athletic trainer. And we need professional education to make practitioners. And that's, that's what our new entry-level master's degrees will do, if you will. But we also need specialists and residencies still that. And we need a means of training clinical practice leaders. And I really think that that's where you're going to see post-professional education and athletic training start to settle out over the next few years. It's in flux right now. People are, are working hard about what they think it's going to look like. Um, I think that the marketplace is going to settle that out far faster than anything that we could do. But advanced practice leaders are, are people who can help create advanced practice to happen, not on an individual one-on-one -on -one with my patient level, but on the system level. So for the system or the organization, the institution, to be able to encompass advanced practice policies across the care that all the patients are receiving. So I would envision those kinds of degrees and advanced practice leaders being very good for people who want to go into leadership roles within athletic training healthcare. So a head athletic trainer, a director of athletic training services, director of a residency, those kinds of things I, I think would be a better fit for what that looks like. The, uh, the other side of post-professional education are for the people who want to be academics. And if you want to be a scholar, <coughs> Excuse me. That looks a little different than being an advanced practice leader. And I don't know that the DAT or whatever we, we see in the post-professional side of athletic training helps you to get to be a scholar. I think there's a traditional pathway for that through the more academic doctors, through the PhD, the EDD, those types of degrees, where you're learning research skills and how to design and implement scholarly work and, and really to become the steward of the profession. The Carnegie Institution talked about being a steward of profession in association with, uh, with the academic doctorate. It's a little bit different role there. But if you ask me, I think the single biggest question for our future is how does post-professional education evolve? And I, I think some other healthcare professions didn't leave room for post-professional education in their model. For example, if we look at, at our colleagues in physical therapy, they went directly to an entry-level doctoral degree. And by doing so, the only real mechanism by which to do post-professional things are to do practice-based things with residencies and fellowships or to go get your PhD and become a scholar. There's no place for that clinical practice leader. I think nursing has, uh, has done a little more interesting job. They have a doctor of nursing practice degree that is out there that sort of fits this bill. And I, I suspect that we'll see athletic training evolve more that direction, but that's gonna be more of a bottom up than a top down evolution as I see it. And so uh, keeping theme with, you know, what you're talking about in terms of advanced practice, moving to entry level masters, all these different things, you know, you touched on a little bit about how it's gonna change the you know, outlook of employment. How do you think that's going to drive the private sector in terms of reimbursements? I don't think it'll be an overnight change, but I don't think we ever get to change without it. And I, I think that that's, that's something I've felt for really a, a long time. I think that some conversations that we've had with our physician partners have, have helped me form my, my opinion on this. When I talk with our docs who are on the Katie and, and some other physicians I work with, they often say things like, if you guys could do this, it would make you so much more valuable in my practice. 
And some of those skills we don't currently have. You know, we tend to define athletic training in a lot of different ways. We define it procedurally. Um, I recently saw a definition that a program had defining us as a physical medicine profession, which, which I don't agree with. Um, if I were to define us, I would define us as a primary care profession. And if you're really bored and looking for something to do, go look at the American Academy of Family Practices definition of primary care. So if you go to AAFP's website, they've got a section on policies and you can look up primary care there. And you read their definition of primary care. If you stick your finger over the word physician, you come out of there saying, that's an athletic trainer. It's about comprehensive care, advocating for the patient. It's about being first contact care, care across the continuum uh, of, of the, the spectrum of care that that patient needs about integrating with and, and referring with other professionals. It talks about primary care being delivered by both physician and non-physician primary care professions. And the ones that specifically list there are physician assistant and nurse practitioner. I, I think that verifying our skill set as a primary care practitioner makes us a lot more valuable to our physician partners who frankly are looking for some people to help fill those roles. Physician assistant was largely envisioned to be a primary care role, but most PAs are coming out of PA school and seeing the money available in the specialty areas, and they're going right into specialty practice in orthopedics, cardiology, and those kinds of areas. There's still a primary care gap where we can help fill a, an existing need with things that are small skill additions to our overall skill set. Your overall skill set as an athletic trainer is you treat whatever just walked in the door. Whether that's a guy with a hangnail or somebody with a blown ACL or somebody in the middle of an acute appendicitis, whatever walked in the door is what we treat. And we have the overall framework to do that very well, but we're missing a couple of key tools in our tool set. And I, I think that as we see the expansion of our practice in future years, it's going to be because of, of adding those tools. And I think that makes us more valuable. Um, I recently had a, a conversation with a, a couple of athletic trainers about what they think the future might hold. And, and one of them made an observation that I hadn't given a lot of thought to, but I, I, it kind of makes sense. Imagine an athletic trainer with a little bit of advanced primary care skill sets that we, we don't use right now in an urgent care. Right. And, you know, in that kind of a model, imagine the, the value that you represent to the owners of that urgent care in terms of the kind of patients you can treat and the kind of patients you can manage. And even at an expanded salary compared to where we are now, we're still a pretty good value in being a comprehensive provider. I think there's a great opportunity for us to look into that market. I think working side by side with our physicians and their practices is a great opportunity. I think that there are a lot of things that you'll see evolve in athletics over the next 10 to 15 years that look different than you see now particularly with the, the recent move to some protected autonomy for healthcare providers in the athletics arena. You know, we're not answerable to coaches in the current NCAA paradigm. And, you know, I, I think that NCAA is moving in a direction where they are going to envision a more medical model for the care of their patients. And I think that we need to have the tool set to get there. So all of those things, I think, help with the future economics of athletic trainers. But again, it's not an overnight thing, but I don't know how we ever get to those better economics without us having all the tools we need to fill the role that, that we really need to fill. And so as we keep moving forward and we start closing the gap, you brought up two areas, yeah. primary care and urgent care. And I, I want to be able to replace urgent care with emergency medicine. And so do you start to see going back to, and I'll, you know, obviously let Forrest expand on this, but do you start to see more residency programs in the physician extender model? Do you start to see more residency programs in emergency medicine? Do you start to see more residency programs in uh, other areas that are kind of outside of our bread and butter like orthopedics? The short answer to that is yes to everything. Um, one of the things that, that we're doing at the Katy and that NATA has, has really made a strong push on recently is to start to think of how we talk about ourselves. And instead of saying, I'm a secondary school athletic trainer, I'm a 
college athletic trainer. I'm a physician extender. To start talking about, I'm an athletic trainer in a physician practice. I'm an athletic trainer at a university. I'm an athletic trainer in an emergency medicine setting. And, and leveraging our brand identity there a little bit. But I think you will see creative people do creative things. And I think the marketplace is going to tell us where the residencies are going to come. If you look at the growth of physical therapy residencies, there were a couple and they trickled in, then the floodgate opened and that curve really spiked up pretty quickly with quite a few. And the specialty areas of practice in that profession expanded into a lot of other areas as creative people said, you know what, we can practice in this setting and here's the pieces that we need to do it. And you've now seen specialty areas crop up in physical therapy practice in lots of areas, even including women's health that you probably never would have imagined when they first came out with, with those. I, I would expect a similar kind of thing in athletic training. Once people figure out that, wait a minute, you can do this? Well, I can use you in this setting. And I would expect that, that you'll see some specialty areas and residencies start growing in some of those creative areas that people come up with. Certainly there's a, a lot of use in corporate and industrial. Um, and you know, working with Committee on Practice Advancement, talking with some of the, the creative folks there, doing some of the things that they're doing, you, you look at them and go, I'd have never imagined that coming out of my basic undergraduate athletic training program, but I see the fit and I see how we can be valuable to those kinds of patients. And once we get into being a part of the healthcare team and being patient focused, we're going to focus on well, what do we bring to the care of the patient and how do we leverage that in a unique way. Once we start seeing ourselves in that role, I think that the opportunities are pretty broad for where we might wind up. And so, you know, you're using words, I mean, love, words that I love of value and leverage because it brings into the, you know, the business side of what we do. And I, I really like that part. How do you, you know, from a leadership position that you're in right now, how do you also get the rest of the profession or those that are having trouble keeping up with the changes? to recognize words like value and leverage and return on invest, investment and progress. What, what are some of the tools that the Katie is using to make sure that everybody is evolving, you know, going to the same place? I think you just opened up the biggest can of worms we have. <laughs> I, I do. I think that our biggest barrier to our future is looking backward and not looking forward. And it's very hard for some people to see the future, see the opportunities for change and how they can fit within them. Particular, particularly when we come out of a culture where we have this athletic trainers can't mindset. So I think part of getting there is to leverage our brand. I mentioned talking about, I'm an athletic trainer in a physician practice. Um, putting some value in our own name is a good place to start. I think trying to take our blinders off about what we can't do and start saying that if I get the training for it, I, I not only can I, but I should be doing these kinds of things. Um, I think that that's a valuable piece. I think interprofessional education is a valuable piece because you're going to suddenly realize that things that we sometimes think of as, as advanced practice skills aren't. You know, it's, it's not that hard to give an injection, folks. Pointy end down, push the button. It's a little more to it than that, but I, I oversimplify for, for the case of hyperbole here. But a lot of things that are basic healthcare skills that are done by a medical assistant or an LPN, both of which have considerably less training than we have, we shouldn't be intimidated by doing. I think part of that answer also involves where we're housed. I think one of our biggest barriers is that we're isolated. And we don't see the rest of healthcare in our training. And we don't see it in our culture as we're being trained. And I think that makes it harder for us to want to embrace some of the things that everybody else in healthcare does. So I mentioned that I would anticipate some future standards that look at where athletic training education programs are housed. I think that that's a very important integral piece of ultimately getting where we need to be culturally. Our culture has to change for our future to change. And we have to, to see it and embrace it. And this is change and change is hard. 
and people are always resistant to change. And do I think we're going to get there in my career? Boy, I'd love it if we do. I don't know that we will. I think we're going to lay a, as good a foundation as we can lay. And I'm really hoping to pass that baton to the next generation, to my students who get to build on that foundation and really reach that mainstream piece that we're trying to get to. Um, not only do I think we'll get there, but I think we have to. Because if we don't, the healthcare world is changing and we're moving away from you know, fee-for-service kind of care. We're moving into managed care, which by the way is native to us, but we have to be a part of the team if we're going to do that. And if we're not on the team, then we will be on the fringe and left on the sidelines. And there are plenty of other professions who would like to compete with, uh, with us in the marketplace, even in our own traditional settings. And if we can't show that we have education and training to, to help do all the things we want to do, we're even at risk in our own backyard, let alone expansion of practice for the future. So it's a cultural shift. We have a lot of work to do. It starts with people talking the right talk and, and trying to paint that picture for who we're going to be as a member of the healthcare team, helping our students embrace that because the picture we paint for their future is perhaps more important than the picture we paint for the change of those of us who've been out there for a long time. You know, um, some of the specialists or adjuncts that I use in my program are a physical therapist, a physician, a psychologist, and a registered dietitian. And without fail, whenever they teach a class for me, they always say that, wow, I didn't realize that athletic trainers needed to know all of these different things that they're teaching and engaging in. And one of the areas that always comes up is how do the athletic trainer, the athletic training students get exposed to this? And then inevitably it goes down to you know, clinical education hours. And so one of the conversations that I have with my medical director, who's an incredible advocate and, uh, you know, just an amazing person for us, is when he was in medical school, the magic number was 80. You know, they did a combination of, of clinical education and coursework, and that those hours equaled 80. Where do you see in terms of athletic training education? You know, right now the KD does not define a policy. It just says that there needs to be a minimum and a maximum. And I think that people need to understand that, that those hours are not coming from the KD. But where do you see the hours expanding to? And how do you, how, going back to the original statement that you said uh, about 45 minutes ago, clinical immersion, how do we start to put all these things together and really allow that student to experience clinical immersion and give them a real life example of, guess what, it doesn't really matter what profession you're in, 40 hours a week doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, um, that's a big question, Josh. So, so, so some thoughts on that. Right now, far too many athletic training students see the world through a one o'clock to five o'clock mindset. And they mirror far too many athletic trainers who think of what we do as providing coverage. When I would really get them to encourage them to think of us as providing care, not coverage. Coverage means I stand there and watch and hope nothing happens. Care means I, I do the things that you need as part of your care. And that care happens in the morning too. When we've got rehab in the morning, we got to work with coaches, we have insurance coordinators, we have in, in outpatient settings, patients who come to us before work. There are a lot of things that happen throughout our day that don't happen between the, the one o'clock and five o'clock afternoon practice window. And when we start thinking of ourselves as healthcare providers and not coverage providers, I think that'll help with that mindset. But how do we get there? When I was a student um, back in the dark ages, you know, we had the wild west in terms of clinical education. We had situations where, you know, you had whole teams by yourself and you didn't necessarily have much input from a certified athletic trainer. And while it taught you to be self-assured, it didn't teach you to be correct or provide good care. It simply taught you to be confident in whatever you, you were doing and you hope you got it right and didn't hurt anybody. We swung that pendulum really, really far the other way to stop using athletic training students as a slave labor force. And in doing so, I think we swung it too far. We swung to the point where 
a lot of people have this mindset where students can't actually do anything. They just get to watch me and, and help me. We need to find that middle ground where you're giving students genuine, authentic experiences where they are participating, not just on the procedure side of care, but also on the decision-making side of healthcare. All of that has to be a piece of what we do. That, that gets them in the right mindset to become the professional we need, but they also need that immersive environment. Um, do I think that will exceed 40 hours? I don't know. I don't know what that will look like, but I know that we've said for a long time that we think immersive clinical education is something that we value and that our standards committee is, is taking a look at how we might do that. But I think you're going to have to have periods of immersion where you're not getting together in the classroom, but you're really getting reps with patients. As you said correctly, we do not have an hours policy with the Katie. So there is no such thing as a 20 hour rule, although that gets cited all the time. Programs have to have a minimum and they have to have a maximum and they have to follow their own policy and their policy has to make sense for what their students are doing. Uh, I think you'll probably see a lot of that kind of spirit as we go forward where there, a lot of things are determined through institutional autonomy, but you're going to have to justify what it, what that's going to look like. Do I know, do I think we're going to get to 80 hours a week? I don't know. I don't know that, that that truly is what makes you a good healthcare provider. And I've had this debate several times with a couple of docs. Um, I don't know that waking up bleary eyed at three in the morning when you're on call as a resident provides good healthcare. But I think that, that showing up part of the day and only seeing part of the practice and not seeing it immersively and across the spectrum doesn't work. I don't know that we're gonna prescribe just exactly what that looks like other than you're gonna have to have some kind of an immersion. I've got some ideas for how I might do it in my program, but you know what? I'm in a big place. We have six full-time athletic training facilities. We've got more than 20 certified athletic trainers on our athletic staff. My world will look different than a small liberal arts college. It has a single athletic training facility and two or three staff and a smaller number of teams. I think there are ways you can develop this regardless of your model. So I think we have to be careful not to be overly prescriptive because one size won't fit all. The concept has to be there, but you have to figure out what's going to work at your institution to make that happen. Great. Um, this is where I exit the conversation because Monday is my NASA day. Um, so I leave the University of Houston. I head down to NASA and work with, uh, we have two full-time athletic trainers down there and a strength coach, and they're part of the astronaut strength conditioning rehabilitation program. They're doing a great job, and obviously they've gotten a lot of press lately because Scott just came down after a year in space. So, um, Mark, as always, I, I love being a part of the conversations with you. I, I feel like I can talk to you about this forever and ever and ever. So thank you for agreeing to be a part of this. Jeremy, thanks for including me. Sure thing. And uh, this is where I sign out. I right, see you, Josh. Yeah, thanks. Bye. All right, so Dr. Merrick, um, I think at the beginning you had mentioned a town hall meeting. Did you say you had a town hall meeting coming up? Uh, we, as a, as the Katie, we talk at a couple of the district meetings where we're going to have large amounts of educators. So, uh, the GLADA meeting, the Great Lakes Athletic Trainers Association District 4 meeting is coming up at the end of this week. So I'm going to be, uh, flying off to GLADA on Wednesday and delivering, a, an, the Katie update at that talk, uh, as, as part of that meeting. I'm also going to be part of a round table discussion and the student programming. Um, a few other folks are going to talk a little bit about some educational matters as well. But we talk in a number of the district meetings. We don't always get every district meeting every year, um, but we, we try to get out there as often as we can. We also talk at our accreditation conference. We're usually available and, and try to do some programming through the educators conference or through the NATA meeting as well in June. All right. Um, one of the questions from the chat room here, Carlos asks, and this is something that I've seen in some of the, the comments in the like the second day schools athletic trainer group. Mm -hmm. um, with the all the different jobs that athletic trainers may find themselves in, is there going to be a point where they have to stop calling themselves athletic trainers? Because, you know, if we're getting all these specializations and, and that kind of thing, then when when do we go back to what we define ourselves as? That's a great question. So I would ask you, what is an athletic trainer? And I think that we're not one thing. You know, we have athletic trainers who come out who work in a secondary school setting. And I was a secondary school athletic trainer before I went back and, and did the academic side of my career. Um, 
Do I think that we will use all of our tool sets in every setting? And the answer is no. I think the professional coming out needs to have a full toolbox. And you're going to find yourself in some settings where you use more skills um, in one area than in another. But the I, I don't know that we're going to need to rename ourselves. And, and the reality is we need to have a better, clear uh, definition of what the profession of athletic training is. And when you look at it, it's worded pretty broadly. I think it will stay pretty broad. And I don't know that every athletic trainer will use every skill set that we have, but I think that you'll find that our practice changes over the next few years to even in whatever setting you're in, where your role may change a little bit and you may take on more responsibilities for what you've been trained to do. All right. Fair enough. Just kind of, I like how you said uh, we need to say I'm an athletic trainer here. I'm an athletic trainer. You're not, I'm a, I'm a secondary school or I'm a college. I like that, that we are, you're building identity and, and uh, I think you said brand identity uh, into that. And so I think that's important because, you know, I am an athletic trainer who works with Arasi. I am an athletic trainer who works mm -hmm. in a doctor's office. Uh, you know, I am an athletic trainer who, who puts casts on people, you know, whatever my specialization and, and training is allowed. So I think that's, that's important there and saying we're not just only working in the athletic training room in the high school setting, but mm -hmm. we're athletic trainers that work in all these different spots. All right, so there's a, another question. Casey says, in short term, do you think that the transition to an entry-level master's will cause a shortage of available athletic trainers um, to employers, or do you feel that the change will deter prospective students who may have been interested um, when it was just the entry-level bachelor's degree? I think it's a good question. I think it's one that we actually hear a lot. So let's understand a little bit about our existing programs because this will help you understand about the capacity to train athletic trainers. There are 375 accredited athletic training programs right now, um, professional programs that lead to BOC exam eligibility. That number is always in flux. So we lose a few programs who close each year, we gain some new. Um, that number has been continually increasing over the last few years. I think that it's likely with the transition that we'll see an overall decline in the number of programs. So I, I think that's a reasonable expectation to have. It's hard to project accurately what that might look like. We know that programs who are having difficulties with preparing well-prepared students who can pass the boards on their first try now are certainly some of the most vulnerable of those programs. And I think that programs at institutions where they may not have graduate study or would also be particularly vulnerable. But those are only a fraction of the total number of programs we have. The average cohort graduating from an athletic training education program right now is about 10 students. When you look at the capacity that those programs report, the capacity is over double that. So from a hypothetical standpoint, if we lost 50% of our programs, we would still have available spots in those programs to train everybody who's currently being trained. Now that's na uh, nationwide. That doesn't mean that regionally it's, it's always gonna work out that way, but we are nowhere near our existing programs capacity. When you look at other healthcare professions, most of them have far fewer programs than we have, usually in the order of, of half as many programs as we do, but their typical cohort sizes are 20 to 40 students in a cohort. I think our model right now looks different than everybody else in healthcare, but I think there's plenty of capacity in that model. So I, I'm not really worried we're going to see a shortage of athletic trainers. I do think we'll see a change in the number though. I think that as we move to a master's entry, we are far, far less likely to have that student in our program who's planning to do athletic training and then jump to physical therapy school or athletic training and jump to physician assistant or occupational therapy. So I think we're more likely to have students in our programs who plan to practice athletic training, not really use it as a stepping stone. I also think we're about to open the door to all of our student athletes who would like to get into this profession, but couldn't do this in an undergraduate program because they can't do that and be an athlete at their institution as well. Well, that's possible at some places now, particularly at, at division three and smaller schools, but at larger schools, it's just not really feasible. And there's a whole avenue of people who would like to do this profession who just don't get the opportunity. So I think that when the smoke clears, we'll probably see fewer programs, 
I don't know that we're going to see diminished capacity. It's interesting you said that we are currently in the uh, position of we're having we have we teach sports medicine here at my high school and I, and throughout our district and we are having to set up a curricular program that is you know to where they are in sports medicine one their freshman year and then athletic training you know they're in the athletic training room doing helping and getting hands on their second year and then back to sports medicine too and then back to athletic training and just the the process you were talking about we were we can't allow athletes in into the program because our athletic periods are when they're in athletics so either they're going to be only in the, the after school part and they don't get to do the curriculum part or they don't get to be in athletic period because they're going to do the sports medicine part and it's just it's funny to me how it's kind of mimicking the the college level mm -hmm. you know and all this is pretty brand new for us i think we're in our, in our second year of having career pass in in high school um but i don't know it just this stood out to me is is i don't know funny <laughs> we talk a lot about how athletic training is not a terribly diverse profession we don't see a lot of folks from other racial and ethnic groups and other backgrounds make it into athletic training and I think some of the doors are closed right now to some of those populations becoming athletic trainers. Well, closed is a sort of, it's a barrier at least. And I really think that this change will allow some folks who have come through the athletics route and learned about our profession that way to have some entree into this field. So I, I think we may actually even see an increase in diversity as well as an increase in opportunity for some of those folks. But again, as far as, from a capacity standpoint, we're underutilized in our capacity right now. I, I think what we're likely to see is a future where we see consolidation. So I'll pick on my own state for the moment. The state of Ohio um, has a lot of athletic training professional education programs. We, uh, we were at 26 for a long time and then we gained one and lost one and there's another one in the queue. So we're going to be at 27 accredited programs in Ohio. There are three programs in my city, Ohio State Capitol and Otterbein all have a program in the greater Columbus, Ohio area. Um, when you look at Northeast Ohio, Akron and Kent State are only a few miles apart. Toledo and Bowling Green, a few miles apart. Uh, you know, Cincinnati, Wright State, Miami of Ohio, only reasonably small area. I suspect that some programs who have the resources are gonna continue to, to continue on and other programs who close I think you're going to start seeing more athletic trainers join <coughs> the faculties of some of those those remaining programs and they become bigger and more viable and when you look at the average athletic training program we don't have very many faculty you know just last july we imposed a standard on the katie uh the katie side of the world that said you have to have a second full-time athletic trainer on your faculty too and that was a barrier to some programs Look at your chemistry department. Does it have two faculty? Look at your almost any other department. What we've done is we have we have done the athletic trainer thing to our education. And what I mean by that, I, I say with, with love in my heart as an athletic trainer, we find a way to get it done and done less expensively, just finding a way to make it work. That's what we do. We're problem solvers. But when we did that on the educational side, we found a way where, okay, we can have one full-time faculty now too, and I can make a whole program work because I'll use the athletic training room as a teaching lab, and we'll get some of the athletic training staff to maybe have a course for us here or there. And we'll find a way to do this without a lot of resources and without a fully established faculty. I think one of the things you will see in the future is rather than having the generalist athletic trainer we can teach every program in the, in the curriculum. I fully suspect in the future, you're going to see that the faculty have to have areas of specialization. You know, for me, I'm a modalities person. Uh, I do a lot of work with, with therapeutic modalities. As, I'm a physiologist by training. So you, know, you don't want me teaching your biomechanics class. Could I teach a biomechanics class? I absolutely had to. I probably could. It wouldn't be very good. It'd be pretty bare bones. Now, you take my modalities class, on the other hand, and it's going to be a pretty rich course. We're going to talk about a lot of things that go well beyond the depth of the textbook. Athletic training faculty need to have areas of specialization and expertise because that enriches our education and enriches our programs. 
And we can't do that with a faculty of one or two. As programs consolidate, and we have fewer programs, you're going to see those existing faculty migrate into other programs, and they're going to become stronger. And I really think that's going to be better in the long run for all of us. Again, same here at the high school. If there was only one of us, then there's no way I could teach the kids uh, how to, you know, what we do in sports medicine and as student athletic training aides, um, if there was just one of us. So, you know, we have two of us so we can have the sports medicine curriculum. So I, I think that's awesome. Uh, and again, it's I think it improves education. Uh, I know that there's a lot going on there. Uh, you know, you have a lot of experience in making these decisions. It's not just one person throwing that idea, but you have teams of people, uh, you know, coming up and improving ideas. So um, I just got one more question and then that way you can get to uh, whatever you got next for the day. Um, what is up next for you as president of the Commission on a, uh, of Accreditation of Athletic Training Education? You can say Katie, we do. It's a lot easier to say. So what's up next? Um, the president's term for the Katie is two years. And I became president last August, so you know I've got a little, little less than a year and a half remaining in my term. I think I have plenty to do um, between the degree change and seeing what future standards are going to look like in future educational content. I think that's going to keep me full completely through my presidential term, and and probably will keep the Katie very busy even into the next term, which is uh, which is Leslie uh, Taylor from Texas Tech will become the next president. She's our president elect. So I don't know that we have a lot of new initiatives that are going to be going on other than the things I've already talked about. I think professional, post-professional education needs to get sorted out. And I think that we're going to have to do some concerted effort and resources and focusing on that. I think the other area that we haven't talked about on this podcast that's, that's really starting to ramp up is international athletic training. You know, we know that we have uh, mutual recognition agreements now with, uh, with Ireland and Canada, and people who come out of the educational programs in those countries are eligible to sit for the BOC exam. But you know, we're talking now with people in England, and people in Spain, and people in Japan, and Taiwan, and Korea, and, and, a lot, and Brazil, and, and China. You know, a lot of other countries are very interested in what we do, and they have people who do some of the things we do. They don't always look exactly like us. But I think the globalization of practice is something that's going to really ramp up over the next several years. And it's something that we're in tune with at the KD, and we're, we're looking for ways that we can help support that to happen. So, you know, in terms of things we haven't talked about, that's probably the biggest one that's still out there. That's pretty cool. I didn't know that uh, international AT was, was one of the topics. So maybe at some point later on, either you or, like you said, the next president I can have come on talk about uh, the in international athletic training, them being allowed to be taking the, the BOC. So that's pretty cool. Well, the World Federation of Athletic Training and Therapy, WFAT, if you will, is sort of the, the member organization that, that helps promote that internationally. And it's supported pretty well by NATA. And NATA has an international committee. And, and we're working on some international things. And BOC has worked on it. So it's not just a Katie thing. It's, it's everybody is sort of getting there. So that might be a, a great topic for a future podcast. Very cool. Very interesting. All right. Uh, so, Dr. Mark Merrick, if somebody wants to get a hold of you, find out more, um, or maybe see if you want to come speak at one of their meetings, then how would they best do that? Well, the best way is to email me through my Katie email address. And it's pretty simple. It's Merrick at Katie.net. So, M-E-R-R-I-C-K at Katie, C-A-A-T-E dot net. And I'd also put in a plug here, go visit the Katie website sometime and, and it's a lot of information there that you might not realize is there, including things like the cohort size and pass rates of every program in the country. So you can learn a lot of information at the KD website as well. And the KD website, um, is it C-A-A-T-E yep. dot net? Yes, KD dot net. KD dot net. And then it's M-E-R-R-I-C-K at KD dot net. If you want to email Dr. Mark Merrick about any of the stuff we've talked about, any of the stuff that's coming up, or possibly having them, uh, you know, speak via Skype or in person at, at uh, one of the events you have coming up. So uh, any final closing thoughts about the future of athletic training education? I think maybe the only parting shot is take a look at who we can become and, and work to get there. Very good. I like that. All right. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and close it out if you don't mind. And then, uh, 
sportshealth.com slash SMB. That's our partner to bring added value to the listeners of SMB. So you can register to win a gift card every month. So the password for March is Bubba. And the password for April is Frio. So me and Bubba are going to be talking at the SPATS conference coming up this summer. And or he's going to be talking. I'm going to be broadcasting live there. Um, I'll see you there as well. You'll be at SPATS? Yeah, I've been at SPATS for years and years and years. Really? All the way from Ohio? Believe it or not. Wow, very, it's a small, small world. So very cool. I look forward to talking with you again. So, all right. So look for me and Bubba and Dr. Merrick at Spats this summer. Um, and then my website, sportsmedicinebroadcast.com slash C-A-A-T-E or Katie. That's where this episode will be posted uh, or you can find this episode easily once it's posted. Uh, almost every single Wednesday except for in the March. This is National Athletic Training Month. We're doing an episode per school day. So we're not doing it over spring break, but per school day. Very, very busy month for me here on the podcast. I am Jeremy Jackson on Twitter. I am at PHS Sports Med. So that's where I am a lot. That's where I am the most, I think, as far as social media. So for Jeremy, Dr. Josh Allen, Dr. Mark Merrick, that is a wrap. All right. Thanks, Dr. Merrick. Thank you very much. See you soon. Bye.